Right. Everybody, good morning and welcome to today's Veterans Day special, Big Lake Now. This morning I have a very special guest to uh, my family, a friend of ours and a WWE legend, Steve Kern. Good morning, Steve. How are you doing? Awesome, Bianca. How are you? Good. Thanks for getting up with us this, getting up with us this morning. <laughs> Um, no problem. We, I appreciate it. So, you know, Vince has told me this story about your dad and how he is one of only two men in history to be held as a prisoner in two wars. That's correct. So I wanted to call and, you know, let you share your the story of him. I mean, this is a pretty amazing story. I've seen, you know, the Fox special on it, but I want to hear from you. Um, let us let our listeners know out there um, what, what what happened with your dad. Um, I try to condense it the best I can, Bianca, and just tell you an overall draft of the story is my mom and dad, um, and when they were young, they were in the, <clears throat> my mom was in the Navy and my dad was in the Army Air Corps. It was during World War II. Um, they were on trains going the opposite ways in Memphis, Tennessee. My dad was a single guy, my mom a single girl. My dad made a bet with a couple of the uh, his Army buddies and said, hey, listen, I'm going to go over there and make a date with one of those waves for after the war. So he got off the train, went over, he bought a bag of peanuts on the stand there and got in the, on the train and said, any of you girls don't have a husband or a boyfriend? And my mom raised her hand. So my dad said, would you mind writing to me? I don't have anybody to write to, and I'm going to war. And so they exchanged addresses, and uh, my dad went on. He was a co-pilot of a B-17 he was in a battle in Germany called the Bloody 100, where most of the B-17s they sent in were shot down. My dad um, was shot down at 19 years old and was captured and became a prisoner of war in Germany. He was a POW in Germany for um, approximately nine months, and um, the war came to an end. Basically, he was released, and when he came home, he dated my mom for two months and married her. And they were married for 55 years. Wow. Now, when I was 13, my dad was stationed at MacDill Air Force Base here in Tampa, Florida. And he was a fighter pilot at the time. He, he got back into the service after the war had ended, and he um, tried a few different jobs. And then he got back into the service, and it turned out to be the Air Force then. And he flew several planes, and he did what he really wanted to do in the beginning, was be a fighter pilot, not a bomber pilot. So he got the option to fly the F-4, uh, the Phantom, which was the fastest fighter the United States military had. And July 24, 1965, he was shot down with the first SAM missile ever used in a war um, over Hanoi. And he was the 14th POW in Hanoi and was detained in Hanoi for almost eight years. And that was the time of, from 13 to 21 that I was going through my life that I was without my dad. But he did come home at the end of the war. Um, they lived a happy life. My dad died in 2000. Um, he died four days before Memorial Day, and he was buried on Memorial Day. It was a total fitting to the end of my dad's life. Um, to be buried in a cemetery where the flags were everywhere. He had a fly bo fly over uh, with a missing man formation and an honor guard and a, a beautiful ceremony, and it was a fitting end for my, my hero, my dad. And my mom just passed away in January at 93, and um, she just basically had lived after my dad had passed away a little bit lonely and a little bit depressed, but at the same time, she kept kicking, and um, she she went in her sleep, but very peaceful, and so I'm I'm so satisfied the way my my parents passed on, but at the same time, you know, uh, Veterans Day is very special to me, as are all of the military holidays. Right. How's that for a condensed story? <laughs> that was a pretty good. We have more time than that, but um, okay. Well, yeah. Keep talking. <laughs> yeah. So one of the things that I read was that you actually, your family had to keep this a secret for some time. Absolutely. Um, the people that weren't familiar with what was going on in Vietnam in those days was the simple fact was that we never signed a declaration of war between the United States and Vietnam. So they didn't hold to the Geneva Convention so far as treatment of POWs. And um, 
we had no idea what they would do. And the military advised us when the first picture came out of my dad. They had, at the first when they first came to our house on July 24th. Um, we were told my dad was deceased, that his plane had exploded, the, the SAM missile had blown the plane up, and there was no survivors because it, some of the pilots had circled back looking for, you know, parachutes or whatever, and they didn't see anything when my dad's plane got shot down. It was three months almost um, to the day that my mom had a call from the Tampa Tribune here in in Tampa and wanted her to identify a picture that they had picked up from the Red Cross of a, a prisoner of war being marched through the streets of Hanoi. Well, my mom, you know, immediately looked at the picture and knew it was my dad. He looked a little bit wore out, looked like he had lost a little bit of weight, but it was still him. And she was excited, but my mom was from in the Navy and my mom was strictly military. And my mom says, well, I can't identify this man. And she called the uh, authorities at McDill Air Force Base, they came out, they took the pictures away from the media, um, took all the film, they run them off, and they pulled us all in as a family and said, listen, we don't know what they will do to you here in the United States. We don't know what they'll do to your your dad, your husband over in Vietnam. We'd rather keep this a secret. So for three years, we went without ever exposing the fact that my dad had been identified and was presumed alive in Hanoi as a prisoner of war just to basically go along with the government. Um, it wasn't until some time after when there was quite a few prisoners at that time, my, my grandmother kind of let the cat out of the bag up in Ohio that her son was a prisoner of war. Mm. But by then, everything had kind of loosened up a little bit. There were so many anti-war activists in the United States pro, um, protesting the Vietnam War they were really in fear for us here being kidnapped and also just something happening in the United States to us that would put pressure on my dad as a POW. Right. So it was a big secret. <laughs> right. I can see that. And so whenever it finally came out, I mean, for you, I mean, what a roller coaster of emotion to think that you'd lost your father, you and your, your family, to think that you'd lost your dad. And then to find out that, well, he's still alive, but he's in a prison, and we don't know when you're going to see him again. I mean, what kind of emotions did you guys go through whenever, you know, this came out? Well, you know, Bianca, I'm 63 years old right now, and between 13 and 21, it was the, the time of my life when I needed fatherly direction. Um, I needed somebody to tell me how to do things, teach me things, and it was an emotional roller coaster. But my mom was a um, super tough woman. She held us together. There was only myself, and I have an older sister, the three of us, and she held us together, and, you know, she just basically set up that could be, you know, a couple years, could be a long time, but we're going to be sitting here waiting for him when he comes home. So um, our faith in God is what really brought us through. There's no doubt in our minds. Um, so... That basically set the pattern for my life so far as my Christianity and my faith in the Lord. So your mom, she said that, you know, a pretty good example. I know I read a story that she prayed, you know, relentlessly for your dad, for him to come home. And uh, Absolutely. Be, be there wasn't a night that went by that I didn't pass her room or something on the way to my to go to bed or go in the back, and I would that I didn't see her on her knees. And... You know, as a young person growing up, you know, you're just looking as examples, you know, for things. And, you know, I, there were, I'm sure there was times in my life at that time that I just didn't believe that it was worth what she was doing. But mm -hmm. when I saw the big picture and now that I've lived my life and I saw how dedicated she was to prayer and how it did actually come true, all of her wishes, you know, that she had prayed for, it really set my mind in a different tempo that, you know, made me a strong believer. And to this day, I mean, you know, that's what gets us through life. I mean, life is not easy. I mean, it's a roller coaster. And when you accept the fact that it's a roller coaster, you'll have your ups and your downs. Some are more serious than others. But, you know, if you have faith, he's going to bring you through it all. It says in the Bible, he'll never give you anything he can't handle with you together. So that's just the way we live here at 
this house anyway. Right. <laughs> so from 13 to 20, you know, you, you've mentioned a couple times, a few times, of course, you didn't have, you know, that father that you felt like you needed at that time. How did, right. you know, this shape you into adulthood and into your, even your, your career that you ended up in? Well, I'm not really sure. I, I, I'd rather not go to a psychiatrist, to be honest <laughs> with you, because they'd probably tell me I'm crazy. Oh, no. <laughs> I mean, you know, ended up in the wrestling business. I'm in my fourth decade now in the wrestling business, I'm somewhere around 44, 45 years. But I, um, I just, it's, it's really hard to figure out, you know, if the molding and everything was done personally, or I reached out. And Eddie Graham was a promoter and a wrestler here in the state of Florida. His son, Mike Graham, was one of my school buddies growing up. And he kind of took a place in my life where he took me hunting a couple of times, and he, he took me out fishing, and he showed a real interest in me. And I think it was out of appreciation for what my dad was doing for his country. And so... He gave me some concepts and some ideas. I don't want to say that he's the one totally molded me, but at the same time, he kind of helped out a lot. And there was a little bit of an idolism towards him because it he was notoriety. He had, uh, you know, recognition anywhere he went. Everybody knew who Eddie Graham was. And, you know, he was bigger than life. And then a tough guy on top of everything else. And I don't know if it's like that for all young men growing up. But you're always looking for a hero, and it was a long time before I really realized who my real hero was, was my dad and my mom for their sacrifices as veterans. But at the time, you know, Eddie, Eddie kind of helped me along, gave me ideas, gave me some um, enthusiasm towards life, and just saying that, you know, your dad would want you to be, you know, um, a, you know a really honest man, an important man, whatever it is, but... Eddie kind of picked up the the ball there for a while, and that's how I kind of moved right on into wrestling. He gave me part-time jobs working with the youth that he had in camps and stuff so far as volunteering and going out and teaching um, skills like horseback riding and things like that that he had at his camp. And, you know, he just gave me opportunities to do things and stay busy while my dad was gone. And I kind of just fell in love with wrestling business. And from about, I'd say, 16 on, I was focused on being a professional wrestler, not being a doctor, lawyer, or an Indian chief. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so your, when your dad came home, the story says that your mom actually rolled out a red carpet. Absolutely. We still have the red carpet to this day in our garage rolled up. Nice. Well, when my dad came home, the first place he came home, realistically, was uh, Montgomery, Alabama. There were seven hospitals set up for the prisoners of war that came home. There was over 2,000 prisoners of war. So when they came home, they had designated hospitals all over the United States. The closest one to us was in Montgomery, Alabama at Maxwell Air Force Base. And so we flew to Maxwell Air Force Base and met my dad for the very first time after his release right there. Now, two weeks later after my dad had spent time in Maxwell being debriefed and going through medical checkups and stuff. He came to Tampa and there was another reunion here in Tampa. And that's where my mom had taken and bought a red uh, piece of red carpet and rolled it from her front door all the way to the street. So after we met him at the air force base and there was a little bit of a parade coming to the house that there was a carpet, a red carpet. And uh, he walked up his red carpet back to his house <laughs> Yeah. So how did he, were you already in the wrestling business then when he came home and how did he take to that? What did he think about? What were his thoughts about that? I mean, I know he was excited to be home, but what were his thoughts about, you know, the career that you had chosen and, you know, did he thank Eddie for taking care of you those years? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Him and Eddie became good friends and Eddie had an airplane, a little small Cessna. I'm pretty sure it was called a Cessna. I'm not sure about airplanes. Um, but he had a little airplane that would fly us all over the state to wrestle in different parts of the, the state, like Miami and Fort Lauderdale and um, all around Fort Myers and places like that. But um, my dad and him became good friends. And, you know, it. Um, so far as what Eddie had done and so far as my career, my dad was open to pretty much anything. He was just so glad to be home. And I think he really wanted me to go into the Air Force and follow in his footsteps. But, 
you know, without him being around and encouraging me toward me towards that and pushing me towards that, I really had no motivation as my dad being a prisoner of war, it wasn't something that I was really fired up to get into. I mean, you know, so he never really put my my choices down. He always encouraged me and he always supported me. It was a little rough at first, I think, and one of the very first <laughs> things that happened was the night my dad landed, they they had us at um, kind of like a hotel on a uh, base in Maxwell Air Force Base. And they came to us as a family and said, okay, we're going to take just the wives and staff cars out to the flight line. <clears throat> we'll have them lined up. And as the men get off the plane, we'll have a colonel escort with each car. They'll come out, open the door, put them in the car, and bring them right over here. And I'd already started wrestling and had kind of a little bit of an attitude. I'd say kind of a lot of an attitude yeah. at that time because I was told that I had to be the man of my family the day that my dad was shot down. At 13 years old, the full colonel pulled me by the arm into my room and said, your dad is dead. You have to be the man of the family and grow up right now and stop crying. Wow. Well, I had that attitude as I was in charge of everybody. I was the man. And then being a professional wrestler on top of that, I guess I was a little cocky. But I told the guy when he said, just the wives, I looked him in in the face and said, that ain't going to happen. And he kind of gave me a puzzled look. And so he made, so I said, I'm going to be in that car. I said, and I get a little emotional, sorry, but I said, listen, my dad saw me the last time standing on the flight line when he left. And by God, one way or another, I'm going to be on that flight line when he comes home, whether you're going to let me go in this car or I'm going to walk over there on my own. So, in arguing a little bit back and forth, he, you know, asked my mom, do you have any control over this guy? My mom said, well, I do, but I agree with him. Right. So I got to go. And, and when I got to go in the car, it was kind of funny. Um, he kept saying to me, he says, okay, all your job is just open the door. Just open the door and let him in. And then, well, when my dad got off the airplane, my dad got off. And he was um, one of the longest held POWs, and he got to say make a statement. Well, my dad got off, and they handed him a microphone. My dad said, the only thing I have to say is old glory is the most beautiful of all. They really didn't want to say anything about treatment or anything at that time because this was the very first plane home. Right. Well, about that time, at about 2.40, I opened the door and took off running. Mm. I ran all the way across the flight line bear hugged my dad, took off running. I was crying my eyes out. Couldn't say anything to him. Um, he just basically was going, I sure hope that's you, son. I mean, you know, because I was such much, so much bigger, bigger than him, running with him in my arms, and I got him to the car. And then, you know, from there on, the story gets a lot better. <laughs> right, yeah. Wow. And so, I mean, so it's a good thing that you had that attitude to make sure that you got to see your dad on that flight line. I mean, that's one benefit to, you know, having to toughen up at such an early age, I guess, you know. Well, you know, Bianca, it was a really strange situation, Vietnam. And so many people lost their lives and became disabled and so many sacrifices for this country. It was a shame that there was a lot of people in the United States that were so set against it when they came home, blame soldiers. I mean, I went with my dad several times when he gave speeches, and they booed him in a lot of places and called him a war criminal. And I, I was pretty cocky, like I said, and I was ready to fight everybody in audiences and stuff like that. But I, was, I felt bad for him at times because of all that sacrifice. But he was a tough soldier. One thing you find about really true soldiers in the United States um, services of all, they're usually humble. They don't come home and um, gripe and complain or brag or whatever of what all their accomplishments. They look at it as, like, like my dad, I asked him one time, do you hold a grudge against the Vietnam people? He said, no, son, they were doing their job and I was doing mine. We're professional soldiers. So, I kind of got it, but at the same time, I was never a soldier, so maybe I'm missing a little bit of that, but 
I'm just uh, really proud of him, and I'm glad that he didn't carry a, a anger with him to his grave, and yeah. he just accepted what happened to him as part of his job. Yeah, I mean, our soldiers that come, they come back from war, and, and even in Vietnam, I mean, that was probably one of the maybe the worst times to go through as a soldier because of so much stigma against soldiers and people in our armed forces. But it's your it was their job. It's what they had to do. It's not. And now I think, you know, we've grown up a little bit as a country and the nation that we understand that it's not something that the soldiers do what they're told to do. That's their job. That's what they signed up for. And so, you know, it's too bad that yeah, you went through and that. It's but. for our freedoms. And, and, you know, it's like sometimes it's sad to me to see people that don't understand. But, you know, they they risk their lives. They risk, you know, um, being disabled. My son is a doctor at the VA hospital up here in Tampa, Florida, Corey. And I hear so many sad stories about veterans and so many sad stories about you know, disabled guys and, you know, loneliness and can't find jobs and things like that. It just break your heart. I mean, you know, but at the same time, I think the public is starting to realize, you know, maybe a new generation will come forward and realize just how they got all the freedoms that they have here in the United States, all the sacrifices that were made to get those freedoms. And obviously, the most important thing is don't forget the military holidays. If you're a proud American, Fly a flag, put it on the front of your house. I don't care, but always remember these guys and women and men and even their families that made the ultimate sacrifices for this country to get to the freedoms we have. Right. And he was, I mean, your father went, he was there for eight years. And so I I know one of the first lines was he lost 100 pounds. He came back 100 pounds lighter than when he went in. Well, we we had the opportunity to see my dad in that eight-year period over a few holidays like decorating and Christmas, and they were all propaganda photographs and, and video reels making it look like they were doing these things, but it wasn't really true. But at the time, we, we saw my dad go. He was about 220 pounds when he was shot down, and he came home at 160 pounds, but he had got down to really 120 pounds. And in 1967, they marched him through the streets of Hanoi, handcuffed and shackled, and they were going to execute all the POWs uh, that they had detained. And there was a a president at the time, I believe it was Johnson, that made a national address that they execute the first American POW, will will declare war. That stopped the executions, and my dad got turned around and pulled back, and they took him back to Hanoi Hilton, where he was at. But we saw him then, and he looked so thin. I mean, you know, you could see just the movement in his leg as he was stepping forward in the picture, how his pants and his legs were so thin and his body was so thin. Um, My dad said as as treatment, it was the worst treatment. Between Germany and Vietnam and his comparable of being a prisoner of war, he said in Germany he was treated like a prisoner. In Vietnam he was treated like an animal. And starvation and things like that were part of the torture. I often, you know, was in question of some of the things that happened to him, but he didn't really just sit there and tell me stories of torture and stuff. The only thing he defined for me, he said, is, you know what the worst torture there is as a prisoner? He said, it's not, um, you know, bending your arms, tearing your, your ligaments or anything like that. It's hunger. It's hunger. Mm. He said, hunger is the worst torture there is. He says, because it's relentless. It never gives up. It turns your stomach. It knots your body. And then you just feel like you're dying for a long time. So, you know, I would have thought it's all the tortures that I know he endured. I didn't think that that would be the main one. But after he said it to me, it kind of stuck in my head. And that's why it's so important for us to help the hungry people in the United States. I mean, we have people being tortured right here, and they're not even at war. They just don't have enough food to eat. So I'm adamant about food drives and things like that for the people that are starving and stuff, only because of what my dad taught me about the torture really in hunger. Yeah. 
Well, Steve, I mean, this was an amazing interview. I think it was very fitting to have on this Veterans Day. And I know even this morning, I've got a, a different look, a, a new look on what this day means. Um, it means even more that, you know, I, I've been able to hear the story of your dad and the story of what your family has had to go through. So I appreciate you calling in this morning and talking to us. And um, thank you for the lessons that you shared, you know, just to keep on having faith and to love your family when you have them. Um, and to also, God bless you, your family, Steve. I mean, you're an amazing guy, so you turned out just fine. And um, uh, <laughs> God bless the United States. We all States. have our downfalls, and we all, you know, fall short of the glory. But at the same time, if you just keep digging and if you get, just keep trying to, you know, be more Jesus-like, you know, it, it has a way of coming to you. And I seem to think that it's come to me in my latter part of my life more than my former, because it, it seems I'm getting closer to meeting the Lord at <laughs> 63 years old. Hopefully I'll live a good, healthy life for a long time, but I'm ready to go when he's ready for me. So the only thing that I can say is God bless America. Right. God bless the USA. Amen. All right, Steve. Well, thank you so much, and we hope to see you soon. All right, Bianca, give the girls a big hug for me, and um, you tell Vince I said I love him, and I love your family, and I love coming down there, and LaBelle and everything, and I'm going to be coming down there pretty soon, so okay. I'll see you real soon. All right, see you soon. All right, Bianca, okay, bye-bye. Bye.